Welcome. I'm Donna Lowry. I'm the, the correspondent and also the host for Lawmakers on Georgia Public Broadcasting. You are watching the Atlanta Press Club Loudermilk Young Debate Series. This is the primary election debate for U.S. Senate. In order to ensure everyone's safety, candidates are participating from their homes. The Atlanta Press Club gives a special thank you to the broadcast partner of Georgia Public Broadcasting for helping to organize the video debates. So let's meet the candidates. They are in alphabetical order. Sarah Riggs Amico, recently served as chair of her family's trucking company. Markeith De Jesus is a member of the NAACP, the Urban League of Atlanta, and the Healthcare Financial Management Association. James Knox is a veteran of the Air Force and served in Iraq as a Department of Defense civilian and earned a service medal for his work there. Tricia McCracken previously ran for the District 12 House of Representatives and Lieutenant Governor of Georgia. We are unable to reach her. We did not reach Ms. McCracken and her campaign, but she was invited to this debate. John Ossoff is an investigative journalist and filmmaker. Maya Dillard Smith is an attorney and the former executive director of the ACLU. Teresa Tomlinson is a lawyer and was the first female mayor of Columbus, Georgia. I am joined and thrilled to be joined by Greg Bluestein, who is political reporter for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Now let's get started. Please note candidates will have 60 seconds to answer their questions and 30 seconds to respond to rebuttals for the full set of rules. You can go to the Atlanta Press Club website, which is atlantapressclub.org. So to start the debate, each candidate will be asked one question. And Greg, you will get the first question to James Knox. Yeah, Mr. Knox, let's get right to it. What should Congress prioritize in order to help repair the pandemic's damage to the economy? I think that um, Congress needs to prioritize the value of people. I think that it's, more, it's, re it's really important right now to get ahead of ourselves as we did in the state of Georgia in terms of trying to get back, to get the economy back working. The most important thing is for us to show the value of our citizens. The citizens are the driving force behind this. I've reached out to several congressional uh, colleagues, when, I apologize, uh, senators, and said that we have to get, we have to make sure that we are prioritizing people first, and we need to have a structure so that we can speak with one voice as a nation. I've asked, I've asked President uh, Trump and his leads to appoint a flag officer in this capacity that would show that we are speaking with a single voice. All leadership decisions need to be funneled through that person and we can speak with a unified okay. voice. States should not be competing against each other to get PPE to our healthcare heroes. So we need to prioritize uh, getting, making sure that we're doing this the right way and putting someone else in charge of this initiative. Thank you, Mr. Knox. I will now ask a question of Maya Dillard Smith. Ms. Smith, in several interviews, you have claimed you were ousted or pushed out as president of the ACLU of Georgia. Some believe that it's because of your stance on transgender issues. Can you explain why you left the campaign? Why I left the ACLU? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you so much for asking. Uh, you know, I am a firm defender and believer of civil and human rights. I was delighted to become the youngest state director uh, of, a, of an affiliate of the ACLU, which is the preeminent public interest law firm and uh, civil rights advocacy organization. We parted ways because of philosophical differences. The ACLU has politicized itself in a way that no longer just fundamentally represents the rights of all people. It also had taken to um, receiving donations from the extreme conservative right. And in so doing, I believe eviscerated its true mission, which is the defense of 15. all uh, rights of uh, all individuals and human beings. So uh, we parted ways, but certainly I believe firmly and have continued to work uh, across the state in the defense of, of all rights. Thank you. Thank you. Greg, please ask a question of Sarah Riggs Amico. 
And Ms. Amico, you've called yourself a re recovering Republican and been to Mitt Romney and other Republican candidates in the past. Why should Democrats trust you as the party's pick over other candidates who have stayed in the party all of their careers? Thank you, Greg. Um, I had the incredible honor to be the 2018 Democratic nominee here in Georgia for Lieutenant Governor, running alongside Stacey Abrams. In that race, I earned over 1.8 million votes, more than any Democrat in the history of our state seeking that office and half a million more votes than David Perdue has ever won. I was endorsed by former President Barack Obama. And look, I've been very straightforward with the people of Georgia. I'm not a lifelong partisan Democrat. Over the years, I have supported a couple of Republicans. I've also supported dozens and dozens of Democrats. But I can tell you there's only one family in here, one party, excuse me, fighting for your family, fighting for working families' economic justice, fighting to protect our right to vote and secure our elections, 15. and fighting to ensure that no one is sick because they are poor or poor because they are sick, and that is the Democratic Party. I am so proud to be here with my Democratic colleagues today. Thank you. Markeith DeJesus, my question is to you. As a member of the Healthcare Financial Management Association, you know it could take years for the healthcare industry to recover from the financial losses related to the COVID-19 pandemic. What do you see as key to helping them recover? Well, I believe the first thing that we need to recognize is that healthcare uh, workers do not have the appropriate PPE uh, that they need to combat this. Uh, we also need to look at uh, the mental instability uh, that this has caused on healthcare workers. Uh, I believe that there was an ER physician in New York, uh, Dr. Green, uh, that. Uh, <coughs> helping those patients to test positive for um, COVID-19 as she should be in an ER physician. Uh, she herself then contracted uh, the COVID-19 became positive and then later took her own life. What this pandemic is doing to our healthcare professionals from a mental status is overwhelming. We've got to equip the uh, healthcare employees with more 15. Uh, PPE, uh, the appropriate and necessary uh, assistance from a mental status. All right. Thank you very much. I want to remind everyone that everybody's mic is on all the time. So even a cough or a sneeze or anything will pick up. All right. Greg, please ask a question now to Teresa Tomlinson. And Mayor Tomlinson, you faced scrutiny over the local government's use of prison labor while you were mayor of Columbus. How do you respond to criticism that you didn't do enough to reduce the city's reliance on the work camp? Well, Greg, we completely reformed our budget to get us prepared to um, remove our reliance off the work camp. That was actually one of the things that I was very vocal about my entire eight years. We increased um, the garbage rate, so it would be closer to the fair market value of that service in the private sector. Uh, we reformed our budget in many regards. In fact, I was the first mayor to present a, um, a balanced budget in 16 years in Columbus because of the, uh, of the steps we took to do that. And as you know, uh, we also reformed our work camp so that it became more of a job training rehabilitation center where we graduated the most GED um, uh, participants of any work camp in the state of Georgia. It is a state camp after all. And we had soft skills training where individuals, hundreds of prisoners were able to go through so they could be more prepared 15. for jobs when they left. We had a, an innovative program with Columbus Technical College where they received certificates of accomplishment for the work that they did. And I banned the box and we began to hire our own prisoners. It's a model that we need to use Thank throughout you. the state of Georgia and Thank you, throughout Mayor. the nation. Thank you. John Ossoff, on your website, you say you will push for an unprecedented infrastructure program as investments that will create job training and employment opportunities. Coming out of the pandemic response, the country will need to revitalize the, the economy more than ever, of course. Where would you begin to help the, uh, the economy rebound? Thank you, Donna. Thank you to everyone for hosting this. Thanks to everyone tuned in at home. We are going to have to rebuild from the wreckage of an economy that is suffering so badly right now during this COVID-19 crisis. And we're going to have to do that while we also build our public health capacity. We need massive investments in clean energy. We need massive investments in transit and transportation infrastructure. 
And by the way, Donna, this is something where most Georgians and most Americans agree. There is broad bipartisan support for an ambitious infrastructure bill that will yield returns to our economy in the long run and create jobs and relieve economic pain in the short run. But David Perdue, our incumbent senator, he'll never back the necessary legislation and he'll never back it with strong enough environmental okay. provisions because he's bought and paid for by the fossil fuel industry. And when you have a senator like David Perdue taking thousands of dollars from corporate PACs for polluters, we'll never see from him the action on the environment we need as part of this infrastructure package. That, thank you very much. That concludes our second round. Uh, for those just joining us, I want to let you know this is the debate between Democratic candidates and U.S. Senate. Greg Bluestein and I will now continue to question the candidates until we run out of time. I will determine when a rebuttal is appropriate. Candidates may raise their hand if they feel that they want to respond. I apologize. This is the round in which the candidates will ask questions of each other. I'm sorry, I must have my scripts out of place. Uh, each one of you will have the chance to ask a question of another person. And we are going to start with, um, you'll, you'll have 60 seconds, of course, on that, and then 30 seconds for rebuttal by random selection. Mark Heath DeJesus, you may ask the first question to an opponent of your choice. Certainly. Thank you so much. My question is for Teresa Tomlinson. Uh, recently, a video surfaced of you talking to a room of supporters about your victory over an African-American megachurch pastor saying that you ran um, uh, in a runoff with an African-American megachurch pastor and won 68 percent of the vote because the people realized it was a very serious time for very serious people. And they wanted a steady hand on the wheel to navigate this new journey. My we need the question, is, please. Certainly. Are you suggesting that African-Americans aren't serious about this election and that an African-American candidate is incapable of having a steady hand to navigate Georgia through this journey? Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Of course not, Marquise. And thank you for letting me clarify that. There's actually going to be many videos of me talking about that story because it was an amazing journey for the city of Columbus, uh, where they had the opportunity to elect either the first African-American mayor or the first woman mayor. And we had a robust discussion about all sorts of things. My point was that the citizens wanted somebody who was who had had expertise in government, who had made government work for the people, as I had working with the United States Senate Banking Committee, multiple federal agencies and in the court system. And I respected my colleague very much in that race. We had a wonderful 11 month journey together and I ended up winning 68 percent of the vote. But then in reelection, also won with well over 60 percent of the vote and carried every African-American precinct 15? at 80 percent or more. And that would have never happened if I had even suggested the type of disrespect that you've suggested I shown, which is just not the case. So thank you for allowing me to clear that up because it's just not correct. Mr. DeJesus, you have a chance for a 30 second rebuttal. So what you're saying to me is that the NAACP chair director um, that spoke in regards to that is incorrect in their suggestion. I couldn't hear you exactly, uh, so I'm not sure you said something about the NAACP. All I can tell you is if there's a video, it would speak in its totality because I speak to speak respectfully uh, to people of all times, and particularly about that incident, which was very well covered in the paper, and there's no hint of what you've suggested. All right. Thank you very much. John Ossoff, it is your turn to ask a question of one of your opponents. Thank you, Donna. My question is for you, Mr. Knox. Thank you for your service to our country, your service in Iraq. Uh, you are a decorated uh, retiree from the U.S. Armed Forces. Many of us who have not served uh, cannot have the same experience that you have of dealing with the VA after service and active duty. And I'd like to ask if you'll take the opportunity now, based upon your experience, Mr. Knox, to lay out how you believe we can work together across party lines to ensure that the VA is delivering the health care that every veteran has earned. Absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for that question. As you know uh, from my website, uh, that the reason I'm in this race is that I'm passionate about veterans care. 
Um, my, my platform speaks holistically about veterans care. Every day we lose 22 veterans. Every, that means almost one veteran per hour. Every 65 minute, minutes, a veteran commits suicide because we haven't, we haven't engendered the partnerships that we need across the, Georgia and across the country. I'll give you an example when I talk about holistic care. In the city of Atlanta, for example, 40% of veterans that miss appointments are due to transportation. Yet we have a robust infrastructure for transportation in Atlanta. I, for the life of me, can't understand why a veteran can't show up, produce an ID card or a DD-214 and ride that transportation. That would free up so okay. many other opportunities. <clears throat> so what, what my, my vision is of the VA, where veterans are underserved, especially in rural communities, we would foster partnerships with local hospitals that will be able to give to grant them care. But it's much broader than that. And 60 seconds wouldn't do it, so I apologize. Thank you. All right. Mr. Ossoff, do you have a rebuttal? Well, I want to echo Mr. Knox's sentiment that access to health care is a huge and unnecessary burden for so many veterans. And even here in Atlanta, where we have one of the largest VA hospitals in the region, veterans often have to wait two or three months for essential care. And across the state, we need to do a better job of ensuring that everyone 15. who has served our country gets the health care they need. Thank you, Mr. Knox, for imparting that wisdom and for your service to our country. Thank you. And I want to remind everyone once again that your microphones are not only hot, but it, for a couple of you, you may need to get closer to your microphones. Mr. Knox, I noticed you're, you put your microphone up on your head. So you may want to pull it down when you speak. You don't have to do it until you speak. And then also, Mr. <coughs> Jesus, you may want to get a little closer to your computer. These are uh, different times for a debate. We're doing things new this time, so we've got to try some new things. All right, now it's time for Sarah Rufamico, your turn. Hi, thank you very much. My question is actually for Maya. Maya, you shared in our debate on Tuesday last week a little bit about your journey as a mom running for the U.S. Senate uh, and as a fellow mom running for this office and one who's taken note that less than 5% of our Congress is made up of moms of young children. I'd like to know what you can share and what you want voters to know about being in the race for the United States Senate as a mom. Uh, this country continues to struggle with policies like affordable child care, appropriate funding for public education that isn't based on the wealthiness of your zip code. Uh, and I think moms can speak in this moment in particular, Question. challenging economic times. Uh, what is it that you would want voters to know about your journey as a mom running for office? Thank you. Thanks so much for the question, Sarah. Uh, I became a mom at 16. I started uh, college at 17 with an 11 month old at UC Berkeley. Uh, I studied economics there and I went on to obtain a master's in public policy from Harvard at 21. I went back to law school as a working mom of three. I was a judge at 29 for nearly a decade. I've worked in every branch of the federal government and I was recruited to Georgia to lead the state uh, for civil and human rights for the ACLU. And I can tell you at every journey, um, at every juncture, I have had to figure out how to stretch a budget, how to juggle family and career. And as moms are being called to do more in the midst of COVID-19, we are recognizing the brunt 15. of what moms experience in homeschooling and <coughs> being housed and making sure uh, kids are fed. And so I certainly support things like universal child care, K through 12 equal public uh, finance uh, for education. Uh, Georgia has 180 school time. districts and nearly 80 of them are still under consent decree. Your, from the your civil time rights is Commission. up. Ms. Uh, Riggs Amico, do you have a rebuttal? Yes, I just want to thank Maya for sharing her story. I think in this moment in particular, when working families have been the hardest hit by the economic crisis that COVID-19 has created, uh, we see constant calls from people like Governor Brian Kemp to fully reopen the economy. Uh, but the reality is we're going to need solutions to things like affordable child care uh, in order for that to happen. And I can tell you, if you put a bunch of moms in the Senate, uh, we will make sure that reproductive autonomy, child care, public Thank education you. are fully funded. Thank you so much. Now we're back to you, uh, Maya <laughs> Dillard-Smith. Please ask your question of one of your opponents. Sure. My question is for you, Teresa. You lauded your uh, success 
as a two-term mayor of a predominantly African-American city. I've spent a lot of time in Columbus and Muskogee <laughs> County. I was just down in Macon, Bibb County yesterday uh, administering COVID-19 tests. And I can tell you that I hear from a lot of constituents in Columbus, their disappointment of your leadership and your failures to create robust economic opportunity for African-Americans in the city that you led and your failures to create black cultural districts. Can you speak to your uh, failures in not creating such districts in a predominant uh, African-American community? Oh my goodness, I would always love to please 100% of the people and get 100% of the vote, but 68% and 63% are pretty good. And as I said, carrying those African-American precincts with over 80% of the vote, I think, does speak to an affirmation of the type of leadership. And I'm not sure who you were speaking with, but we actually, one of the one of the marks of my leadership was reversing blight by lifting up uh, predominantly minority communities. Um, we did uh, several things off of uh, Victory Drive, which is an area that's been struggled for, struggling for some period of time, passing tax allocation districts, and also in a place called City Village, which was very uh, culturally and, and, and community stressed because of blight. Um, but we started to turn those things around by building up the communities and not having 15. gentrification, which is really uh, amazing. And so, um, again, I, I think that, you know, my reputation speaks for me. We were able to reduce the unemployment rate by less than uh, by more than half um, and provide tremendous opportunities and, and increase the wealth of thank our you. Um, of our folks here. So I, I'm, I'm not up. sure where you got your information, but thank you for the opportunity. Ms. Dillard Smith, do you have a rebuttal? I do. Thank you so much. Well, certainly Liberty Theater has been a hot button issue and it's being widely debated right now. I'm in constant contact with individuals who serve on the board. And there are there's a deep sentiment of a failure to, you know, robustly invest in African-American economic opportunity and real estate. I can tell you, certainly uh, that as we are combating this covid crisis, affordable housing and development and equal opportunity in those resources as we pass infrastructure will certainly be critical. And we need a leader in the U.S. Senate that certainly understands e Thank you very much. economic opportunity. Thank you yes, very much. Well, we, we did, in fact, uh, do that. Liberty District has been controversial. You're right. And it continues to be today. But you didn't mention Arbor Point or Chase Homes or Patriot Point or any of the other wonderful uh, homes that we did in partnership with our housing authority to really elevate communities here, Columbus Commons and so many others um, are our national examples. So, again, thank you for allowing me to clear that up. Thank you very much. James Knox, it is now your turn to ask a question of one of your opponents. Uh, Brad Thomason, uh, I, I hate to uh, make it seem as though we're piling on, though, but I do have because I have a veterans issue and you're you're yeah. a representative. Um, you're representative of the second largest military footprint in the, in the state of Georgia. So mm -hmm. I have to, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. What what platform, what outreach programs did you do to uh, I think let me digress here. You know, considering you have the second largest uh, military base and footprint in Georgia, mm -hmm. what veteran outreach programs did you develop uh, to ensure yeah. veterans were adequately served in the Columbus uh, area? Well, you're spot on to ask, because as, as you may know, I was the chief liaison with Fort Benning. That's why I hold a national security secret clearance for the Department of Defense and work very closely with them on issues of, of deployment, how that impacted the family. We have actually a, an amazing partnership uh, with Fort Benning in Columbus. It's a, it's a seamless uh, relationship we've had for many, many years. And so we did a couple of things. One, we reduced homelessness in Columbus by 40%, but we reduced veterans homelessness uh, under my leadership and a team of people working on it to what they call net zero. So in Columbus, we don't have any uh, veteran homeless unless, of course, we've not been able to reach them yet because of perhaps a, a, a mental disorder they might be suffering from at the moment or, or perhaps they've just entered the community. Um, so that's pretty tremendous. And we also had a great partnership with our Chamber of Commerce where retiring um, veterans were able to be put into private jobs that we located. And also we got a great uh, veterans clinic here so our folks didn't have to travel Thank to you. Tuskegee. So Your time uh, has amazing ended. progress. Your time has ended, but Mr. Knox, do you have a rebuttal? I do. Um, 
it's always interesting to me when people say they have a net zero effect. What is a net zero effect? There are people listening who make who, who think that that translates, Mayor, to that we have zero veteran. It means That's that right. you use a formula to determine that. We have to be clear when we're when we're when we're abandoning our veterans and we're not right. doing, we're not partnering in the right way with our veterans and we're representing them as having a zero impact of, in terms of homelessness in terms yeah. of homelessness in your community so we have to be careful and i'm not here to attack you but this for any mayor i want to make sure that they understand we shouldn't come on these debates and say we have a net zero effect thank you very when we much actually have a five to seven percent margin that we may be dealing your time with. is thank over you. mr Knox. Mm -hmm. thank you very much now, what what that means Mr. Knox, is a net zero impact means that there are no veteran homelessness that don't have an opportunity to be housed with wraparound services. So we have a place for every veteran, and we there may be a moment where we haven't been able to get to them yet because of a mental illness. They ha don't have a moment of lucidity at this time, but we actually have programs uh, where we interact with them so we can seek those opportunities when we have them, and then we have a place for them to have a home. Thank you very much. And it is now time for you, Mayor Tomlinson, to ask the question <laughs> of you. one of your opponents. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll ask to, to Mr. Ossoff. Um, John, you have $30 million in name recognition, uh, yet you lost to Karen Handel, who had $4 million. Uh, you trailed David Perdue by six points statewide and 31 points outside of Metro Atlanta, where Democrats must pick up votes to win. People know you, but not enough want to vote for you. How can we afford to make you our nominee when you lack public service experience, couldn't win your home district, and have very little statewide appeal? Thank you, Teresa. Well, if we want to talk about polling right now, the poll you're referring to is a Republican poll, and it was widely understood to show that Senator Perdue is vulnerable. Your campaign is so weak, weak, they didn't even bother polling your name in that poll. But let's talk about something substantive. And I have a very specific question for you, Mayor, which is that under your watch and even into the last year of your mayorship in Columbus, prisoners were cleaning Columbus's golf courses for $3 per day. And my question to you, and I'm not looking here for a litany of other policies or shifting of blame to other public officials. My question is a yes or no question, and it's very specific. Do you believe that prisoners cleaning golf courses for $3 a day 15. was right or was it wrong? And you know, not a lot of folks have regard for politicians, but we do respect politicians who can admit a mistake. So was that policy right or was it wrong? John, I know since you haven't been in public service, I know you don't understand the jurisdiction prison system, um, but it's actually a state prison system. Uh, and they have these work camps that are called trustees. And of course, I have spoken out against it. And as I said, I actually helped transform it. I took over the prison, had um, the uh, Department of Corrections come in and conduct an investigation, relieved the warden and the two deputy wardens to begin the transformation that I talked about that allowed it to be more of a job training rehabilitation center. Uh, and so the program you're talking about, about the $3 a day and so on and so forth, is, is in fact, those are state policies and state requirements. But nevertheless, right. we use that opportunity much, then Mayor. to hire our own prisoners uh, for that very work at that public golf course. Thank you very much. And with that, we, we now conclude our second round. For those just joining us, I well, want to remind I everybody. Get, I'm sorry, Don, I didn't get my rebuttal. You that didn't get his, your rebuttal? His, oh, OK. He, he, well, he we'll go ahead and give you 30 seconds now. All question. right. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, yeah, sure yeah. if that was your rebuttal. All right. just the 30 that second rebuttal, Don. No, 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 no. He, he asked, yes, he asked me a question. I don't think there's an additional so. 30 seconds awarded in this case, Don, is there? No. There's not. Oh, okay. Well, we're that's going, fine. We're going to move on. Ask me a question, but we'll. That's fine, Donna. That's. Yeah. We're going to move on. We're going to move on to our, our next segment. Uh, and this, as a reminder, is the debate for Democratic candidates for U.S. Senate. Now, Greg Bluestein and I will now continue to question the candidates until we run out of time. And I will determine when a rebuttal is appropriate. Candidates may raise their hands if they feel they should get a rebuttal. And Greg, you may have the first question in this round. Yeah, let me, let me keep that going a little bit. Um, Mr. Ossoff, your opponents have experience in city government, corporate world, the legal field. Let me ask you this. What makes your background running an investigative journalism firm more prepared than they are to be a U.S. senator? 
Thank you, Greg. And let me explain to folks watching at home what I do for a living. I run a business that investigates organized crime, political corruption, and war crimes for international news organizations. Our investigations have exposed war crimes committed by ISIS, sexual slavery, human trafficking, high-level bribery, corrupt judges, and crooked police. And I know some politicians like Mayor Tomlinson may not have much respect for investigative journalism because we hold politicians accountable for misdeeds. But at a moment when political corruption is destroying our democracy, when drug prices are through the roof because the power of the drug industry, when our environment is being destroyed because the power of polluting industries, when our own Senator David Perdue sells access to himself and his home for thousands of dollars to corporate PACs, an anti-corruption fighter is exactly what we need in the U.S. Senate right now. All right. Um, uh, Teresa Tomlinson. Yeah, May, thank you so much. But. Uh, I have plenty of respect for journalists and certainly investigative journalists. The only contrast that I have made is that, in fact, I've actually fought corruption using uh, the levers of government and the law as a lawyer who practiced in the federal court system, uh, bringing uh, drug companies, predatory lenders, chemical uh, companies who had perpetrated huge environmental disasters and transportation companies who allowed their their passengers to be burned alive. So making the federal law and federal regulatory law bend towards justice. I've worked with federal agencies as well as um, the United States Senate, the Senate Banking Committee specifically, uh, in order to stop corruption. So my only point has been I've actually used the government and the law, the federal legislative law, to make it work towards, uh, bend towards justice and protect people. Right, thank you very much. This is for Sarah Riggs Amico. You've said in a recent tweet that investing in people matters, it's possible and it creates growth. How do you begin investing in people, especially in the times we're living in right now? Absolutely. Uh, over 30 million Americans have lost their job in this pandemic. Uh, nearly one and a half million of them right here in Georgia. We've seen the pictures from Valdosta with dozens of cars lined up before sunrise to get food from a local food bank. People are terrified. They're going to lose their home when they lose their jobs. They worry about losing their health care and being sick just because they are out of work. Um, these things are unacceptable. And what I believe we need in our next United States senator is somebody who is going to be a champion for those working families. And that's what I've done for 17 years as a business executive. I know what it is to fight to protect organizing rights and labor union jobs because that's what I've done professionally. I am a battle-tested executive in a tough economy. I know what it is to create and save the kind of jobs that politicians usually only talk about on TV. And that's exactly the kind of fight I'm going to take for every one of your families as the next United States Senator. Thank you. James Knox first, and then yeah. Maya Dillard-Smith, and then um, I, I be, believe Mr. DeJesus also raised his hand. Well, I think it's, I think it's important when we talk about value and, change and people, we have to understand that if you want to invest in poverty, we have to start at a root level here. We have to start, Nelson, Nelson Mandela said the most powerful tool to change the world is education. So we have to start there with education. And if you want to, if you want to reduce poverty, you have to reduce a mindset. You have to reduce, you have to understand that people that are poor, they, under, they have a condition that continues them in poverty. Where versus, versus is being broke and that condition is going to end and they're going to they're going to transfer into a better position. So we have to start investing in people. We have to start restructuring our education system first and stop the education or school to prison pipeline. Thank you. If Thank you very much, James Knox. Uh, Maya Dillard Smith. Sure. You know, COVID-19 has redefined our way of life and has restructured our economy. We have a real opportunity in 2020 to do things structurally different, to do things about structural racism, bias, to ensure economic equity. And, 15. you know, Sarah, we applaud the work that you've done in the private sector, but you lack the government expertise to actually restructure budgets during hard economic times. There are reports that your restructuring bankruptcy actually was to avoid pensions and Thank salary you very much. obligations, and that's precisely what state and municipalities Thank are confronted with. Thank you, Ms. Right Dillard now. Smith. Yeah. De Jesus. Don, Donna, I, I believe I get to respond. She you brought can. up the restructuring that my company went you through. You can. 
Uh, as ahead. you know, I helped grow a business that my family bought in 2008 from 100 employees to over 3,000 employees during the depths of the Great Recession. And we did that with paying 100% of health insurance premiums for all of our employees and their families, protecting our unions, providing okay. on-site child care. And last year, we were caught in the middle of a pension crisis that the U.S. Senate specifically has failed to address. There are plenty of politicians in the U.S. Senate. But because of that, I spent my summer saving those 3,000 jobs without a single worker Thank taking a health care or wage cut and saving thousands of pensions. We did it by Thank giving you. up my family's equity. Thank that you. is leadership that, that is we time. need in the U.S. Senate. That is time for you. But Mr. DeJesus, you wanted to say a few words. Certainly. Uh, you know, I think when we start talking about um, persons with executive experience, uh, and, and while I do applaud my uh, Democratic colleague, Sarah Ricks, and Nico, um, we see what executives are capable of doing. Uh, David Perdue himself was an executive. Uh, Donald Trump. 15. Was an executive. We haven't gotten much from executives. What we need as a United States senator is someone who can get down and talk to the people. We need someone who can be relatable, someone who can understand those tabletop discussions that are happening, not just throughout Georgia, Thank you but you very much. the United States. Your time has ended. I want to make sure I, uh, I didn't miss anybody else who may have raised their hands on, to answer this, no? All right, Greg, you have uh, the next question. Yeah, I wanted to ask Ms. Amico, it just came up, a follow-up question about, about her company. Um, your company, as you mentioned, filed for bankruptcy shortly before you entered the race, drawing criticism from Republicans and some of your own rivals. How do you convince voters that you're the right person to make tough economic decisions if you've struggled with your own personal business? Oh, look, I've, I consider the work we did a success. I, this is how I define success, that I was willing to walk away from my own money to save 3,000 jobs without a single person taking a wage cut or a health care cut, saving thousands of pension. Look, the pension crisis isn't a crisis we created, but it's a crisis that as the leader of that business, I partnered with my union to save. Uh, we were very proud of the outcome. In less than three months, we reduced the company's debt by over $300 million, saved 3,000 jobs. We saved thousands of pensions for retirees and employees. And that sacrifice, that willingness to go to bat for working families is exactly why I'm the only candidate in this race with the support of multiple labor unions or any labor unions at all. Fifteen. All right. That's exactly the kind of fight we're going to need. This economy needs to be restructured to put working people at the front of the line for once instead of in the back. And I have that experience, uniquely that experience through the Great Recession, the trade wars and the Thank pension you. crisis. Thank you very much. Marquise de Jesus. You know, that sounds great on paper, uh, but how bad were you really hurting? You say that you walked away from your own salary. You yourself have millions of dollars. So please don't try to use that as walking away, you know, from your own salary that you help your employees. You weren't hurting at all. And we need to make sure that that's plain. There are several millionaires within this race. Uh, and I don't believe any of them who would walk away from their own salary would actually be hurt just to make sure that their employees are. All right. You have 15 or that's that. I, I assume I get a rebuttal to that. You Donna. absolutely do. Yes. Now, I want to be I want to be very clear here um, that I made um, I made some good money as an executive, but I also gave up um, a lot of money just putting in my own money to save jobs and health care. And I'm also very wary of anyone when women are successful and they finally achieve pay equity that we constantly criticize them. The reality is that for women of color in particular, they're still making pennies on the dollar to white men in this race. And I wanna make sure that we're speaking directly to the need for fair and equal pay for women and for people of every race in this country. Maya Dillard-Smith, a rebuttal? Sure, that sounds good, Sarah, but the issue is not about uh, equal pay for women. This is about a, a war in this country between have and have not. And you are part of the half class. John is part of the half class. Teresa is part of the half class. And there are many of us who are part of the have not due to the very structural benefits that you all reap. And so it's dishonest to make it seem as though you're being attacked because you're a woman. I am an African American woman. I do know those statistics well. And I also know that it was 53% of white women that elected the man in the White House 
that we have today. And so we have to be honest and we have to call a thing a thing. And the thing is, is that you are a millionaire who was able to advance money, so you say, but in government, you can't write a blank check. That's part of the problem with the $3 trillion that was just spent by the United States Senate and the United States House. And the Democrats allowed it to go through without care or concern for the very people who are at the bottom Thank of you the, very way, much. the working class people you say Thank you, you want to much. represent. Thank you very much, Ms. Dillard Smith. Uh, the next question I have for uh, Mark Keith De Jesus on your website, you talk about favoring common sense gun control. What does that look like to you? Common sense gun control looks like making sure that the NRA and gun manufacturers are held accountable. Um, you know, you have David Perdue, who has an A plus rating from the NRA. Whenever a civilian can go out and purchase an AR-15 or AK-47 and go out and shoot up, you know, school, mall, there's no common sense gun legislation. We need a senator who will fight to ensure that bump stocks are banned. Uh, we need a senator who will ensure that comprehensive gun legislation will pass from a bipartisan level and make sure that the public knows that we're not, as Democrats, trying to take away their guns. 15? We're trying to keep the guns out of the hands of those mentally uh, unstable uh, or unstable people. All right. Is that the end? Okay. Yes. All right. James Knox, you wanted to uh, do a rebuttal. Yes. Um, when we talk about responsible gun ownership, I served. And I, sp I had an opportunity to speak to a small group of individuals um, in Kennesaw, Georgia. And uh, one of the people talked about, as a Democrat, how I was going to take away their, their weapons. At that meeting, I explained to them that I travel. I, I, I'm a firm supporter of the Second Amendment. I have a weapon when I travel. But I don't believe you need a 100-round or 50-round magazine to if, if you want to have an assault weapon. So if you, say, if you say that you're an enthusiast of sports, and I'll tell you this, if you need 100 rounds, you need to get better at your sport. So we need to reduce that to a responsible level. If you have high power weapons that can do incredible damage, we need to we need to restrict those magazines capacity in terms of what um, Mr. DeJesus was saying. To, we have to restrict those capacities to ten to 50, to six to ten rounds. That if you want it to be a sport, you keep it on a sport. If you can't kill what you're shooting at in six to ten rounds, you probably need to find something else to do. All right. Thank you, Maya hey, Dillard Smith. Please. I'm the only individual uh, in this race who's actually dealt firsthand with gun violence. I know what it is to be both a perpetrator and a victim. I spent 20 years devising violence prevention and gun safety rules and regulations. And I can tell you this, we need a United States Center that, that is up for the fight of responsible gun ownership. As a head of the ACLU and a defender of the Bill of Rights, I believe fully in the right, Second Amendment rights 15. for your arms for the militia purposes of confronting a corrupt government. When we have police that are shooting black and brown men, we need the opportunity to defend ourselves and not in opposition to the police, but certainly in defense of our dominions, of our homes, of our families, of our children. Thank you very and much. Certainly COVID is presenting issues and opportunities around racial Thank profiling you. and police accountability. Thank you. I wanna make sure no one else raised their hand and I missed it. If anybody else wanted to respond to that. No, Greg, go ahead with your question. Yeah, my question is for Ms. Dillard-Smith. Um, you just mentioned um, that three of the candidates uh, in this debate are have candidates, and the, I guess you implied that three are have not. What would you do to balance the economic ledger in Congress in a way that could pass a closely divided U.S. Senate? Certainly. I think one of the primary ways is to really confront the realities of our tax structure. We need comprehensive tax reform that puts working class people first. It is not tax bailouts for the rich. We need to repeal opportunity zones, which is an instrument that was passed by Carson to stimulate economic development in distressed communities, but it has actually exacerbated gentrification. We certainly have to reform predatory lending and the racial profiling that's happening in the banking system that we're now discovering was structurally a reality in the PPP program, which locked out nearly $500 million for African-American-owned businesses. Georgia is the number one place to do business 
the leading driver of small business development here is African American females, and they did not um, were not protected in the use of our federal resources. And certainly, we've got to have a comprehensive economic package for African American people of color and working class people in this country. Thank you, Mayor Tomlinson. Thank you, Donna. Yes, I just wanted to address uh, the invocation of my name related to haves, and I have been so blessed, no doubt, but you need to know, uh, you may see the success, but you don't know the rest. Uh, I'm the first generation born into the middle class. My grandfather had a third grade education and couldn't read and write. They couldn't feed their seven kids. So my mom and, and her uh, brother were actually raised by relatives, and she never graduated from high school. So that's why I've spent my life fighting bullies and bringing justice to people and using government as a tool to solve these challenges of poverty and inequity. Thank you very much. Maya Dilla Smith, you may respond. Yes. Just 30 Thank seconds. You. I certainly love a good American dream story of pulling oneself up by the bootstrap, but certainly, Teresa, I know you're not implying by any stretch of the imagination that you are among the working class in this country. There are those of us who get up every day to go to work, to provide for our families, for our children, to roof over their head, clothes on their back. 15. We are saturated with massive student debt and restructuring it. And so, you know, while I certainly applaud your effort and your lineage and your family, there are those of us who have structural situations that don't have the privilege and who certainly are struggling every day to make sense. Thank you very much. John Ossoff, I have a question for you. The congressional resolution called the Green New Deal is aimed at tackling climate change. As you know, it proposes the federal government gradually reduce fossil fuels, cut back on planet warming, greenhouse gas emissions across the economy. Proponents claim it would guarantee new high paying jobs in clean energy <laughs> industries. Mr. Offsoff, you said recently you don't support it. Why not? And what do you propose to tackle climate change? Thank you, Donna. Well, I'm gr glad we're having this conversation now about how to accelerate the transition to a green and sustainable economy. And it's right that that conversation happened in the context of an infrastructure package. And as for the Green New Deal, when I am in the U.S. Senate. I will push for a historic, unprecedented infrastructure package. I'm not at this time ready to endorse a single resolution that lays out a framework for it until I can understand exactly how we make that resolution work for Georgia. But my priority will be historic investments in infrastructure, in clean energy, in overhauling our electric grid, in making our coastline and our agriculture more resilient to the effects of climate change, and in evidence-based policymaking. We're seeing right now, Donna, what happens 15. when politicians like Donald Trump and David Perdue ignore science, ignore data, and ignore expertise. We cannot afford to keep making the same mistake when it comes to protecting our environment. Thank you. I'd like to ask if any of the other candidates want to talk about the Green New Deal. I see Mayor Tomlinson uh, first, and then we'll Maya Dillard-Smith. Sure, Donna. Thank you. I think a lot of us were shocked when Mr. Ossoff said he didn't support the, new, the Green New Deal. And the, and the point of the matter is, the Green New Deal and resolution is just a series of principles, much like what you laid out, to, to resolve the climate change that we are experiencing right now through fires and floods and intense, intense hurricanes and, and the devastation that has brought our city's okay. infrastructure is crumbling under these rains we can't withstand. And we're paying right now millions of dollars. We have the opportunity to create millions of jobs. And the Green New Deal is a, is a proposal, and it's not a piece of legislation yet. And nobody who believes that the climate is essential to our economic growth should be saying that they're against it. Thank you. Maya Dillard-Smith. Thank you. I'm, I'm the only candidate in this race who actually knows something about what it means to move land conservation, air quality, and water control and protection. I have the great privilege of uh, being the lineage of a 50-acre family farm that's still in operation. We just recently gave the water district an easement. I can tell you this, that the Green New Deal, much like Teresa just laid out, levels out a framework. But what's more critical is that we talk about replacement industry for farmers, for individuals in the disaster recovery around fires, floods, uh, hurricanes, earthquakes, and what that means in the redistribution of wealth and recovery. 
much like we're going to have to do out of COVID-19, we've seen the stalling of resources, particularly here in Georgia and the coastal areas resulting from Hurricane Michael. We've got to streamline the direct resources to the individuals who desperately needed to bring Thank you very much. fundamental principles of the Green New Deal to reality. Thank you. I wanted to ask uh, the other, uh, some of the other candidates. Uh, Sarah Riggs Amico, your, your feelings about the Green New Deal and about climate change solutions. Absolutely. I support the principles of the Green New Deal. And I think that this is one of the top five priorities. I've been very clear that combating climate change and its effects on the health and well-being of our population and our economy would be one of my top five priorities in the U.S. Senate. Uh, I have two little girls. They're seven and nine years old. And the least I can do is help leave them a world with clean air and clean water. And we've seen the Trump administration time and again, enabled by people like David Perdue, who are utterly silent in this debate, dismantle the protections for clean air and clean water, refuse to accept that it is always poor and marginalized communities who are most hurt by climate change. And as a U.S. Senator, I can promise you those issues of environmental justice 15. and equity will be front and center of every policy I support. Thank you. Markeith DeJesus. Well, we can't talk about climate change and um, the Green New Deal without first talking about China, who is already positioning themselves to be a leader um, with regards to renewable energy. China has put $126 billion towards being the leader uh, of renewable energies versus the United States at $46 billion. So we definitely need to make sure that we keep an eye on China because no one wants China to be the leader of, um, of, of making sure that we take a hold of what we are experiencing right now from climate change. It's not a hoax. And we've got to make sure that the general public understands that this is something, if we don't take hold to it right now, we'll be a disaster for our children and our children's children. All right. And Mr. Knox. The reality is you can't refute empirical data. We can we can sit back. We we can visually see the impacts of climate change and the impact it's having. We can see that by the tenacity of, of the hurricanes that are hitting our coast through the tornadoes, through the earthquakes around the world. The reality is, is that we have to support a Green New Deal if we expect if we expect the culture and, uh, and the climate, the, the, if we expect the world as we know it to be here for our kids and grandkids. And I have a one year old grandson this year, uh, this week, Sarah. So I understand that. So we have to make sure we're implementing policies. But I do have to agree. And I, I don't want to give anyone a, a nod or anything. But I do have to agree with John when he said he, we have to understand the framework. We just can't we just can't hitch our wagon to someone touting or saying something that's vogue in terms okay. of the Green New Deal without knowing what that means. We have to understand what a Green New Deal means. And, and is this reasonable? Uh, the President Biden said we'll get there by 2050. Is that aggressive enough? So we have to make sure we have a framework in place that everyone can understand. And that Thank framework you, is Knox. communicated to people so they can Thank understand you. how it'll be implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greg Blutstein. <laughs> Question. So let's switch gears a little bit to a, a, a question for all candidates. We'll start with you, Mayor Tomlinson. Uh, many of you have opposed Governor Kemp's decision to ease the coronavirus restrictions starting, I guess, a week and a half ago. Um, at what point do you think it's safe to start reopening Georgia's economy? And what message do you have uh, for people who do want to restart their businesses and, and, and start to come back? Yeah, Greg, you know, leadership is so hard. And, and one of the hardest things to do as a two-term mayor uh, public safety director and Homeland Security director, I can tell you, is, is telling people something they don't want to hear. Everybody always wants to go back to normal, um, but it's going to have to be a phased plan. I think one of the reasons I've been critical and other people are uncertain about this is because there's no plan. Uh, we went back against CDC guidelines, uh, had people out uh, in, in the community before we'd had two solid weeks of decrease of coronavirus incidences and deaths. And so uh, we don't know now exactly where we are. Um, it, it would be so much better uh, if we had a plan to first get the public safety straight, the civic stability, and that allows us to have economic prosperity. You hear 15. businesses saying, I'm uncomfortable calling my workers back. I'm uncomfortable calling my customers back. And that's because we don't have a plan about what exactly the PPE they might be able to have in their job. And we haven't coordinated with the industry leaders to set that up like union leaders. Thank you. Instance. Thank you. James Knox. Yeah. Same question. Yes. Um, 
I think one of the things that I've said consistently in, in terms of returning people to work, I agree with um, Mayor Thomason. We have to have a, we have to have a strategy. What I've, what I've called for from day one is communicate that plan. So for, for Governor Kemp to say that we should return to work, I think that what he should have done is came out and laid out a phased approach and a strategy. Hey, Here's how much testing we've done. Here's what the numbers say. I'm comfortable with this level. And that would, that would stop some of the consternation from the citizens. So you have to come out. Where, what is your strategic plan? What is your communication plan? How are you going to communicate if we have a relapse? What I've asked people to do uh, for everyone that I communicate with via Twitter, Twitter and social media is to follow the cdc.gov guidance and uh, follow Dr. Dina Grayson's uh, guidance. What Dr. Dina Grayson has done, um, aside from attack attacking the president, what she's done is laid out strategies and amplify what testing means and what a recovery means and how we should go about. She was one of the leading researchers under President Obama for um, <coughs> Ebola. And she's done a great job in terms of getting a plan out there. So thank, thank you. you, Mr. Knox. Sarah Riggs Amico. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind for me, Donna, is who we're putting at risk. The definition of essential workers are some of the same people that we expect to accept $5 an hour minimum wage or $7 an hour minimum wage right here in Georgia. And it's personal for me. My family members have held a lot of these jobs. People in my family were truck drivers, nurses. Uh, my grandmother on my mom's side cleaned hospital rooms until she uh, retired with Alzheimer's. And um, my granddad worked custodian. So these are some of the same people, uh, grocery store workers, frontline healthcare professionals that we're putting in harm's way. Uh, one of the best things we can do to reopen the economy is ensure we're protecting those frontline essential workers, make sure there's widespread testing and tracing capability. Okay. And for goodness sake, don't open businesses like massage parlors or tattoo parlors where you have to be physically touching someone else. I mean, there's a logic gap here for what Brian Kemp has done. And as a small business owner myself, I'm very sympathetic to people who want to get back to work. Uh, but we've got to Thank do it in a much. way that respects science and facts. All right. Marquise de Jesus. You know, I think for government to reopen uh, certain areas of the economy was done prematurely. Uh, and as a healthcare worker working in a major hospital here in Atlanta, I can tell you that we have seen an influx of patients coming in through the emergency room and now being uh, placed in ICU and on uh, ventilators. So I believe that it was a very premature uh, move for Governor Kemp to make, and it should not have been made uh, without a strategic plan. You want workers to go back to work, workers want to go back to work, but you first must test those workers to ensure that they're not putting themselves at risk, but they're not putting any of their co-workers at risk. Thank you very much. John Ossoff. The question that Governor Kemp needs to answer is where are the tests? Everyone wants Georgia's economy to reopen as soon as it's safe to do so. But in the absence of robust public health data, we're flying blind and making economic policy without an understanding of the spread and scope of the disease. And it almost makes you wonder if he doesn't want to know precisely who is suffering and who is dying, because it's no surprise that it's low income families and African-American families and folks in rural parts of the state, folks in places like Albany, who are suffering the most from this disease. And these are the same families who have already faced vicious attacks from our Republican state government through the refusal to expand Medicaid, making so many of our citizens more vulnerable to a okay. pandemic like this. So Governor Kemp needs to account for his abysmal failure to stand up robust testing across Georgia. And he needs to explain to the families of those who continue to die why he has lagged so badly on the public health response. Thank you very much. Maya Dillard Smith. Thank you. And none of my colleagues have answered the question squarely. Yes, testing is insufficient, and we absolutely need to do that before any state is reopened. We absolutely need PPE. Merely giving guidance to cover your face when surgical masks are insufficient or prevent protecting people from this airborne virus when we really need every citizen in our country to have an N95 mask, it's 
implausible to me why we reopen the economy when 80 percent of those who were hospitalized last month are African-American, when Georgia has 10 million individuals, 1.6 million of them seniors, 30 percent of them African-American, and we've only tested 160,000 people. We hosted a testing drive in Macon, move on yesterday. Before we reopen the economy, we've got to 15. get the problems with PPP. Uh, worked out so that businesses, restaurants can get their workers back to work. Hospitality is one of the largest industries in Georgia. We've also got to get the problems with unemployment rectified. When Governor Kemp announced that he was reopening the economy, so you thank, say, he did thank you so very much. without answering questions about how we fix unemployment for those who will be kicked off when we reopen thank you, and Ms. don't show back up because they have decisions to make about exposing themselves in order to take care of their family. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question that I'm, I'm going to direct at Mayor Tomlinson, but I'd like all of you to answer if possible. Perhaps nothing has emphasized the digital divide in Georgia more than the current pandemic, especially when it comes to the need for Georgia students to turn to online education after the schools shut down. So what would you do in Washington to try to even the, that broadband playing field? You know, we actually have just allowed um, such uh, disparity in our edu public education system. And you're right, broadband is chief among them. And that's part of an of, of a infrastructure package we certainly can invest in. It's not just the broadband that here in Georgia we give a lot of lip service to, but then we end up just giving um, incentives to the providers to increase coverage in Atlanta, Columbus, and Macon. That doesn't help us at all. And these kids are there now at home without equal access to education. So I've proposed um, actually spreading through increasing our LTE service, uh, which is faster and could be uh, done more uh, cheaply. But as a United States Senator, it's about finding somebody who is the Secretary of Education who actually believes in public education who will partner with the states to invest in these type of infrastructure programs 15. so that we can provide um, a broad-based education because that's how people get to the middle class. That's how we have economic prosperity is we have got to reach out to rural Georgia and understand it has capacity Thank you. to provide for our economic prosperity in this state too. Thank you. Did anyone else want to answer that question? Please, uh, may I? Maya Diller-Smith. The digital divide is one of the preeminent civil rights issues, and COVID has certainly exemplified and amplified that. Uh, Teresa, I, I don't think you have this, this experience, but I'm certainly at home with my girls uh, who are in middle school and high school, and we are working every day on school assignments. I have homeschooled my children before, and I know what it means when we don't have adequate internet at home. The challenge, however, Teresa, is that we can't ask the Department of Education to do what is out of its program to invest in the infrastructure of broadband. We should be asking that of the private sector companies like Comcast, AT&T, Google, and others who are making a killing. Look at your average bill every month. We have sports fees. We have uh, uh, com com communication fees. The taxes and fees are raping families from the very things that they need to thrive, particularly when we are going more digital and we have to ensure greater access, which means we have to have greater public investment in the ownership of our utilities. Thank you very much, James Knox. And then Teresa I'll Tomlinson, to Teresa I'll let you again. respond. You can go ahead. Actually, uh, Teresa, go ahead and respond and then Mr. Knox. Okay. Yeah, I know I was just going to say very quickly that Maya is absolutely right that these providers do, uh, some of them do participate in these predatory uh, fees and so forth. And of course, I've done a lot of work, as I said, in that regard. And she's right in another regard, and that is that we have not been um, adequately overseeing um, monies that we've been giving to providers for this expansion incentives that we've been giving that they have not been using to actually do it. And the kids are the ones that are suffering. 15. And the federal government can actually um, provide both carrot and stick remedies um, to, to those providers who are not using the incentives as they well should. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Knox. This pandemic has actually manifest the divide between the underserved communities and everyone else. The people, we have to, we have to look at this from a position where we incentivize not just 
private sector, but we have to incentivize our public sectors, senators who are entitled to understand the value that is placed in educating our youth versus imprisoning them. If you look at if you look at our systems in terms of education and imprisonment, there's an 80 percent return on every dollar spent on education versus a zero, a net zero effect for every dollar spent on prisons. So these these actual investments in rural and underserved communities provide a, an actual return on their investment that they can understand if they just looked at the numbers. Thank you very much. Greg, we're going to go back to you for a question. Yeah, Mayor Thomas, I want, I want to give you a chance to respond to something else that Ms. Smith said, because um, should, should candidates who don't have children um, be treated differently in this race? Um, uh, it's come up a few times in this debate, but um, for those and anyone else who, can, who wants to chime in, but um, I, I think Ms. Smith just, just said something about homeschooling, and I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that. Well, Greg, uh, you may not know, but my husband and I actually tried to have children for 10 years. Um, I very much wanted to have children. We were unable, and it was, it was that that sent me into public service. I think every human being wants to leave a legacy of some sort. You want to leave the world better than you find it, and if you can't do it through the miracle of children— uh, then you can certainly try and do it through being a steward of the government that serves them. And I used to tell my friends all the time, you raise the perfect sons and daughters, and I will make sure that they have a community to inherit and live their most prosperous life. Uh, and so I, I think that, you know, we all give back in the way that we can. And so whereas I don't have children, um, just like with anyone else, that where there's a, a specific thing where you don't have a personal relationship uh, or, or experience with that, um, you 15. open your ears, your eyes, and your heart that much more uh, to them and to understand what you can do to be a facilitator of their very best life. And that's what I've done in public service. Thank you very much. Maya Dillard-Smith? Sure. And I certainly uh, wouldn't want to suggest in any way, shape, or form that those who do not have children certainly are not qualified for uh, this job. But I will say there is something to be said about the experience of what it means to raise a family in this economy in these times. I believe that people are looking for someone who's willing to fight on their behalf, who knows what it means to deal with the issues of eviction, who knows what it means to deal with issues of Medicaid, food stamps, uh, utility subsidies, and to devise in Washington actual strategies that do have a trickle-down effect. We have a regressive tax system that actually does not give the benefits to the people who desperately need it most. And those people are the working people. They are people who are going to the essential jobs that each and every one of us are, are harrowing them for. They are the true heroes in this, but they are going to work in Georgia, in the food services industry to make $2 an hour. Thank plus you very tips much. Without the very things that they need. And so they are looking for someone who Thank understands you. what that struggle is. Thank you. We'll go to James Knox. I know you wrote, you had your hands up. No, no go right ahead. You didn't? That's I'm, it. All right. All right. No one else wanted to respond on that one? Okay. Let's go to this. Uh, and I'll start with you, John Ossoff. As you know, Georgia is facing dire budget cuts uh, with the governor asking state agencies to make cuts of as much as 14%. Is it the role of the federal government to help Georgia and other states with their state revenue shortfalls due to the coronavirus? Yes, it is. And and the federal government has no other choice. And the state of Georgia, Governor Kemp and Senator Perdue should leverage the relationship they have with President Trump to ensure the state gets those resources. The cuts that have been proposed to education would have a devastating impact on families and children and schools and teachers across our state. And education is just the beginning. The reduction in local and state tax revenues resulting from this economic crisis and all of the damage being done to families and small businesses will have a massive impact for years to come. And that's why when Congress acts, it should not be lavishing trillions of dollars on Wall Street and major corporations. It should not allow the largest <laughs> firms to fraudulently exploit a small business program to benefit themselves while ordinary people are waiting for $1,200 and small businesses are having difficulty accessing bridge loans. We need a federal economic response that's focused first of all on shoring up the 15. financial standing of the most vulnerable people. And second of all, making sure that state and local government can continue to render vital service like the provision of education, public safety and infrastructure, Thank even you. as private sector activity suffers. All right, that's your time. Sarah Riggs-Amico first. 
Yeah, absolutely. We've talked a lot about what experience qualifies somebody to be a United States senator in this race. And I'd suggest that your question and John's answer are yet another reason that somebody who's actually been a small business owner, who's to get a piece of the payroll protection program uh, and fallen short when the first fund ran out, who's actually built an economy, who grew in a rural area, went to a public, the only public high school where I grew up, has faced many of these challenges in trying to create the kind of jobs that give our families access to prosperity. Uh, this is exactly the reason I'm in this race. It is about creating shared prosperity, giving working families the champion they deserve in public 15. service, finally putting them at the front of the line and building an economy that can work for everyone. So this is exactly the reason we don't need only politicians and attorneys in government. We need nurses, public health experts, military veterans. And yes, we need business people as well who can help design those policies from the perspective of somebody who's had to live Thank with you their very outcome. Much. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Tomlinson. Yes, well, as somebody who actually did help lead a community through a time of the Great Recession, which was incredibly challenging, let me just say that now is the time in this calamity and, and this, this negligent response that we have had to COVID-19 to start investing in the systems because we see that our lack of, of governmental and, and economic and civic infrastructure has allowed COVID-19 to go right to those who are the most vulnerable. So now is the time to begin to invest in education and to create jobs in education, to take the 25 million people we have recently unemployed and begin to provide retraining opportunities so they can go into the healthcare industry, which is so stressed at this time. We're gonna need people in, in, in senior living, uh, assisted living centers um, and so many other things. This, this is the time to open the ACA and let people who are presently unemployed have insurance that is credited and, and provided to them for free during this moment of crisis. This is a time to invest in our governmental systems, and that will be what pulls Thank us you. out of this economic disaster. Thank you. Ma Maya Dillard-Smith? Please. I've managed a billion dollars of public-private resources braiding together federal, state resources, special tax allocations during difficult times. The budget of Columbus today is $115 million. That pales in comparison to the amount of money that I've actually managed and done so during economic times. We need someone who understands the public finance rules and can bring together expansions in Medicaid even during uh, difficult times by leveraging general fund dollars. My opponent, Teresa, talks about making critical investments in education. How can you do that when the states and localities are being asked to make drastic cuts? These are the times when innovation matters and when federal waivers can be leveraged to ensure that resources 15. get directly to local localities and uh, the state. As an example, in these trillion dollar packages, there's no state in Georgia that actually got any resources when there was an automatic provision in that bill that allowed cities with populations over 500,000 to get a direct much. earmark. Atlanta didn't even get an earmark. Where were the U.S. senators when thank, these bills were thank being you very much. not advocating for Georgia? First, I'm going to let uh, Mayor Tomlinson respond and then James Knox. Just, just real quick, um, Columbus, Georgia has a quarter billion dollar uh, budget and also I've managed and led um, a half a billion dollar pension, uh, which we couldn't bankrupt, but we did reform. It was 74 percent funded when I walked in and over 96 percent funded when I left. So uh, there, there's a lot of governmental money and a lot of governmental structure, and it was reformed during my tenure in a way that made it work for the people it served. Thank you. James Knox? Yes, this is exactly the problem with a lot of underserved communities. We make a lot of promises. We come on these campaigns, we make a lot of promises. I'm here today because I'm not a politician and I'm absolutely sick of some of the promises that have been made over time of how you're going to invest in, in rural and urban communities and how you're going to improve our education systems. I just a question to the panel. When's the last time you, you got out of your nice house and went over and volunteered in one of those underserved communities? When is the last time you stopped by a homeless shelter and took food? When is the last time... You keep talking about all these great things that we did in Columbus. When is the last time you went to a Salvation Army for, for a homeless shelter? When is, the last time, when, is, when is the last time that we did something outside of serving ourselves? We had opportunities also to volunteer. We have opportunities also 15. to donate. 
if you if you look at what the first person on this panel did with actual resources that were donated to their campaign, look at Direct Relief, look at my Twitter account, look at the first donation that I made when healthcare heroes were not getting funded. And I sent money to New York to Thank make you, sure Mr. that they Knox. could. Thank you. I'm going to let uh, Mayor Tomlinson respond, and then I want to make sure that uh, Mar Marquise de, de Jesus gets uh, in because he hasn't responded on this. Sure. Well, I, I would I would never, of course, suggest that Mr. Knox doesn't provide generously for the nonprofit organizations that he supports, and I certainly commend that. I haven't been anywhere since March 12th, and I hope none of you all have either. Um, but I will tell you this. Uh, I have spent my entire life working in the field with all kinds, uh, not just with the homeless, but uh, Girls Inc. and, and helping the Boys and 15. Girls Club and, and reaching back to, to make sure these kids, like my mom, have a chance to see what their future might be. So, yes, sir, I've been in the field, and, I, and there is no doubt, can be no question, that both my husband and I have generously Thank supported you. the type of May causes please. you're talking Thank about. You. Proud to do Maya Dillard Smith. Yes. Thank you. So, you know, uh, James, I thank you for the question because there is a lot of puffery of talking about what folks have done in the past. I certainly am someone who has a proven track record of getting things done, and I am a doer. As an example, unlike Teresa, I have been out the house. I was in Macon Bibb County on yesterday, partnering with the Community Church of God 15. and Middle Georgia Food Bank to give out 2,300 bags of food to the third most food scarce county in Georgia. We also tested hundreds of people with both of the COVID-19 tests. I'm that about your delivering time. resources to the people, whether in office Thank or you. not. And we have to hold people accountable we're based now, on track record. We're now going to go to Markeith De Jesus. But to answer the question that was originally okay. posed, yes, the federal government does have a responsibility to assist the states. We also have to have uh, leadership within the state uh, to accept those needed and necessary funds like Medicaid expansion. Uh, if we had Stacey Abrams, who actually won the gubernatorial race in 2018, if she were in office, she would have immediately expanded Medicaid throughout Georgia, which would have assisted in those rural areas where we're losing not just um, uh, farms and, and hospitals, we're losing quite a bit down in our rural areas. So yes, I would absolutely uh, say that uh, federal assistance uh, is needed um, from the federal government in order for us to be able to move progressively forward. Okay. okay, thank you. John Ossoff, I saw your hand up and uh, that'll be the last to answer on this particular question. Thank you. Look, I, this is this has gotten obviously contentious and it's good to have a, a rigorous debate and to criticize each other's records. But let's just remember that a lot of folks out there right now who are not running for office, who are not touting their own accomplishments on television, are putting everything on the line every day to keep this country running and to save lives. My wife works at Grady Hospital as an OBGYN doctor. I know it feels different for me when she walks out the door each day. And it's not just healthcare workers, it's essential workers who are keeping this country running while the federal government continues to botch the governmental response. So let's just keep focused on those who really are serving right now as we have this discussion. All right, but thank you very much. I want to get back to Greg. To say when you don't have I'm sorry, we're, we don't have much time and I want to get back to Greg. If you have a quick question for the last maybe two minutes that we have left before our final segment. Um, yeah, two minutes. OK, um, I did want to ask each of you, uh, starting with Miss Smith, and if you guys could keep it quicker than 10, 15 seconds. Um, obviously, Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic nominee, is facing an allegation of sexual assault by a former Senate aide. Um, should the former vice president face a fuller investigation? Miss Smith, if you could start. I think it's imperative that we both uh, give voice to victims of sexual assault and also due process to the accused is guaranteed under our U.S. Constitution. Certainly in this era where sexual assault has been highlighted in the backlash of the Me Too movement as a sexual assault survivor who understands the importance of people Thank you. coming Thank forward, you. Sarah Riggs I do believe Amigo. that there should be greater scrutiny. Okay. Thank you. We're going to treat, try to keep these short. Yes. Sure. These accusations deserve to be heard in full. And the voters deserve a full investigation of what happens, uh, what happened. And at the same time, uh, Joe Biden does deserve due process. There are processes in place for this, and this is exactly the moment we should be following them. All right, John Ossoff. 
Any allegation of sexual assault needs to be taken seriously in a supercharged political environment. Uh, we need to look carefully. Uh, and, you know, um, only Vice President Biden and the accuser really know what happened here. All right. Marquise de Jesus. Absolutely. Uh, I think when you silence a woman who is claiming uh, sexual uh, assault, uh, you are essentially telling every other woman uh, who may have experienced sexual assault, regardless of their stature in life, that you just need to be quiet. And that's not fair to those victims. So yes, I would say that Biden would need to Thank you. come out and say what needs to be said about what truly happened. Thank you. Teresa Tomlinson? Yeah, the law actually has a system for this that can be used in the political and civic world as well. And that is when a woman makes an allegation, she makes a prima facie statement and it is to be believed and then it is to be rebutted by the accused. And then the burdens on the woman to, to state her case. And here the jurors are the voters. And that's the beauty of this great system we have. And so Thank people you. need to open their ears, listen, and then they need to vote. Thank you very much. James Knox. All, all, all allegations of sexual, sexual assault must be taken seriously. We have to make sure we don't marginalize women in these instances so that they don't come, they don't come for it and they have to suffer in silence. So yes, every, every, every a sexual assault allegation needs to be taken seriously and investigated. All right, thank you very much, candidates. That is all the time we have now for questions. Each candidate will now have 60 seconds for a closing statement. And we begin with Teresa Tomlinson. You get the first closing statement. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. You know, this election could not be more important. We cannot allow David Perdue to default into a second term of six years to fail Georgians and enable this as he has enabled this president and to fail this country. And so we need to know that on June 9th, uh, we will actually um, be nominating somebody who must beat David Perdue. I suggest to you that that must be someone who has won elections and who has governed and governed well. That candidate is me. The United States Senate is the world's most deliberative legislative body. It is not a starter job. It is not a business. That's not an insult to anybody. These are serious times. We need a serious candidate. And I hope you will vote for me, support my candidacy, because together 15. we will make some Georgia political history. We will set this country back on track and we will use my skills to resolve the dysfunction and chaos that has come into our life because of, of this mis mismanagement in Washington, D.C. Thank you. John Ossoff, your closing statement. Donna, Greg, the whole team at GPB, great job. This is a difficult circumstance in which to do your job to inform the public about where candidates stand on the issues. So thank you for your efforts. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thanks to everyone out there working hard to advance our interests and our state's interests amidst this crisis. I don't have a typical political profile. I'm young and I believe my youth is a great strength. I have not made my career in elected office. I've made my career investigating corruption, organized crime, and war crimes for international news organizations all over the world. We have in David Perdue a senator who not only sells access to himself for thousands of dollars from corporate PACs, but when a pandemic was bearing down okay. on our shores, and when the administration's response was so clearly inadequate, he dismissed the threat and adjusted his own stock portfolio to profit. We need to mount an all-out assault on his corruption and corruption in Washington, and I'll do that as Georgia Thank senator. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. James Knox, your closing statement. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Donna. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of my uh, colleagues here that have participated and to all of our constituents. You know, as a son of a janitor and a homemaker, as a veteran, I've been a servant leader for over 30 years. I've served in those underserved communities that we're talking to you about with. I worked in, I volunteered, I've donated, I've mentored in those communities. I understand their needs because I've shared those needs. I've taken the same commitment and ethics to every position that I've held. As a federal civilian, I was selected and deployed to Iraq and worked with the Ministry of Communications, worked with the Ministry of Interior, worked with the Deputy Prime Minister, um, worked with the Deputy Prime Minister because <clears throat> Of the many successes I've, I've earned, because of those many successes, I've earned the opportunity to become That's a Harvard you. Kennedy School Senior Executive Fellow. And I will bring pragmatic solutions to the challenges ahead. Thank you for your time. Stay safe, Georgia, and vote for Knox. Marquise DeJesus, your closing statement. 
Thank you. And thank you to the Georgia Public Broadcast uh, and to our moderators, uh, Donna and to Greg, uh, but most of all to the voters who are watching this. I want you to know that I'm running for the United States Senate because if we don't get David Perdue and Donald Trump out of office in this uh, election in November, we will regret it for the, four, for the next four to six years. We cannot afford to have the same type of uh, lazy-daisical leadership that we've seen from Donald Trump and from David Perdue. You know, the American people, and more specifically Georgians, are tired of the self-serving politicians who only believe in two things, themselves and their wealth. They're also tired of the nastiness 15. that they have, uh, that they see coming from candidates pitching at one another. I want to be that change for Georgians to work on voter suppression, to end gerrymandering, to ensure that every American has access to affordable health care. Thank you very much. Maya Dillard-Smith, your closing statement. Thank you. Everything is at stake in the 2020 elections, and Democrats need four seats to flip the United States Senate. Georgia has two of those seats up for grabs this year. We have the power to decide and set a leadership pathway and blaze a trail from Georgia. I'm committed to taking the skills and expertise of managing a billion dollars, working in every branch of the federal government, working to ensure voting rights are protected and reproductive and maternal health, ensuring that we have fair economic opportunity, that we get folks back to work, but we do so responsibly by protecting the public health. You want someone who can go to Washington to fight on your behalf, I'm committed to doing that on day one. I've 15. written legislation. I've been a rule maker. I've negotiated bipartisan solutions in Washington, at the Capitol, uh, working the halls of Congress, working with colleagues across the aisle to actually deliver things for the people. Thank you very I'm much. I'm committed to doing that on your behalf, and I certainly Thank you. hope to be your support for the next senator in the great state of Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Riggs Amico, you have the final closing statement. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I am a mom to two little girls up here in Cobb County Public Schools, the proud wife of an immigrant husband, a naturalized American citizen, and a business executive for the last 17 years. I've been a small business owner fighting to save and create thousands of jobs in the Great Recession. I've weathered the trade wars that the Trump administration has put forth. I have defended and saved thousands of pensions uh, for my employees and retirees in the middle of the pension crisis. I know what it is to fight for working families, and that's the reason I have the backing of five labor unions 15. so far in this. As the 2018 nominee for lieutenant governor running alongside Stacey Abrams and endorsed by Barack Obama, I went through every corner of this state, and I know that we are just one election away from changing the course of this much. country we and are creating an time. economy that works I, for everyone. I only have time to thank all of you and thank everyone for joining us. Have thank a, a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Donna. Thank you.